what a about gap width of material. Pull it off the stem. And then I'm gonna measure it against the shank of the hook from the from the back of the bead to the end. I'm gonna set that on where my thread is at the back. And I'm gonna tie it down with a couple of wraps on top of the hook. And then I'm just gonna hold the material on top of the hook and open wrap forward to the bead. And that just avoids again having a, a big bump at the back of the fly when you're tying stuff in. Well, I got my thread up at the front. I'm going to take my single strand of crystal flash, which tends to kink up on you here, and I'm going to tie it in at the front, a couple of wraps to hold it in and trim off the excess. Then I'm going to hold it on the far side of the hook and I'm going to wrap down all the way down the body to where the tail is tied in, right at the very back. And that's going to be the rib for the fly. Hold that out of the way. Now comes the tedious part. <laughs> We're going to do dubbing and the technique that you want to use is you want really very little dubbing on the, on the thread. So this is going to take a bit of time. With this dubbing I have to press pretty hard when I'm spinning it on. So you can see you get, don't get much more than doubling the size of the thread. And I'm going to wrap that up the body to just about the halfway point. And I want a tapered body and I want it reasonably fat. So I'm gonna add more dubbing to the thread. And again, making a nice little thin dubbing rope. And then I'm gonna wrap back over the top of what I had Skin, skin that out a little bit. Right to the very back. And then I'm going to wrap forward again. And again, by using small amounts of dubbing to keep the dubbing rope thin, I can control the taper in the abdomen that I'm creating. If I put too much on, then the thread, the dubbing rope gets thick and it, it's really hard to control the shape of the body. So I go back and forth here. And you'll see that as I go, I'm trying to make it much thinner at the back. and thicker as I come forward. Now, I don't want to come too far forward because I need room to make an abdomen, uh, make, make a thorax, I need, need, need room to make a thorax with a, a wing case that's reasonably broad and so I don't want to cram this too far forward, but I want to make sure I have a nice taper. And that's kind of almost there. So the better you get with making skinny dubbing, dubbing ropes, the better this fly will work. So now I've got, I've got a body and I've left room enough for the, ab, for the thorax. I take my uh, bit of crystal flash and I'm going to 
counter wrap it the opposite direction. And I'm going to do like four wraps over this abdomen. So I end up with a, a nicely segmented body. And the one strand of crystal flash is, is enough. You can kind of see there that I'll turn this so you can see the segmentation in the body there. Okay. Now comes the fun part. I'm going to make a uh, make a combined you back back to mallard flank. So I'm going to strip the fluff off of this guy. And and this is the key part here is is prepping the feather. So I want the barbules to be probably I'd say the entire length of the hook and a bit. And I'm going to pick that a feather that has that size of barbules on the side. And I'm going to stroke these barbules backwards from and about again a little more than gap thickness of these barbules I'm going to stroke back. And now you can see I've got the feather somewhat prepared. So when I do that, you'll see I've got this little tip left over. I'm going to go in here and snip the tip off. And then I'm going to stroke the fibers back the way they were before. And you can see I've created this V. And the trick with this V now is I'm going to bring my thread right behind the bead. I'm going to lay the V down on top of the hook with the V just behind the bead. And with a group of fibers on either side of the V, I'm going to hold it on top, hold it with my left hand. I want to spin the bobbin counterclockwise make it fall right and then I'm going to come down with two light wraps and, and this is oh crap this is always the hard part I want to make sure those fibers are on either side of the bead when I do this hold it with my thumb and then go around the bead come on around the bead come on A soft loop around. Come on, go in there. There you go. That didn't work. <laughs> Let's try that again. Maybe if I wet them down a bit, that's better. So I've got it upside down this time. That's probably the better deal. There. Now we go. Now they're sitting on either side of the bead. Now I can make this loop over top. And I cinch it down. I want to make sure I've got fibers on both sides of the bead. Left and right. So you can see now I've got fibers like that. Then I'm going to wrap back over this feather right back to where the abdomen starts. So far, so good. So these are now the legs. And the trick with this is to gently pull them back. Gently pull them back till they're the right length. Okay. 
And what I want for the legs, leg length is for them to be back to the point where they're kind of, there we are, body length. So when I, if I were to fold these back, they'd be a little bit, that's a little too long. So this is the tricky part is getting this on the bead right and then pulling these back so they sit right. Oh, okay, that's just going to have to do. And then comes the seal dubbing. a whole lot because this stuff is pretty spiky it uh, again you don't want to overdo it don't put a whole lot on the on the thread and then I'm going to wrap in between where the legs are out the front and the uh, and the abdomen back there to make a thorax of darker dubbing. And I want that just a hair bigger than the abdomen in behind. So I don't want to overdo it, but it needs to have a bit of bulk. Now comes the fun part, as if the rest of it hasn't been. I'm going to fold these two legs back to the back and pin them at the back with my left hand. And I'm going to pull this bit of fiber forward and down. And then I'm going to take my thread and wrap behind the bead. So now you'll see what I've got is by pulling that remainder of that forward, I've, I've created the wing case over top of the thorax. And when I get it in place, cinch it down a little. And then I'm going to trip this, trim this excess at the front clear. And then to make sure these legs are sort of to the back, I'm going to stroke them down and back. And I'm going to give a good wrap to hold them in place. And then just a teeny bit more dubbing. This also helps position the legs. I'm going to put a little bit of dubbing on the thread. Just enough for about one and a half, two wraps. And I'm going to, again, stroke these guys back and make it couple or three wraps right in front of them behind the bead. You see how that forced the legs back towards the back. And I got them a little bit long because I was having trouble. However, this will work. We finish. And get in here and thread out. And then the last thing I'm going to do is there's a few stragglers here I'm going to pin, pull out. And I'll do it. So I got my legs a little on the long side, but that's more or less it. So Dave, question. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't you just fold the legs first and then tie them down and, and then do the wing case? Is there a particular reason why you, why you do? It, they, it, they keep, it keeps them kind of out of the way and, and keeps them from getting mat together when you're trying to do the wing case. So if you fold them back uh, over top of the dubbing and, and cinch them down, they, they still tend to stick straight out because the, the, uh, the dubbing on the thorax gets in the way. It pushes them out to the side. Dave, um, 
Another question about that technique, that putting those legs on seemed like a really fussy way to do it. It um, is. I've seen other techniques and I've used this where instead of putting, making a V with your feather like you did, um, instead of facing it forward, turn it around, put some, put some uh, dubbing on to make your abdomen, put the, put the wings on facing backwards and then dub over them. And yeah, that's, 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 the tradition, that's the traditional way of doing it. Uh, yeah. This was the way that Lance had designed this one. And, and what it does is it means that the, the legs do stick out to the side. Yeah, they so stick when you strip more. it, yeah. they do this, right? Yeah. They, they don't just lay, lay back and stay in one spot. They tend to spring back out. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. One way I, that, uh, that is similar. I watched it when I was trying. I just overwrapped before I started to pull those legs back, and they ended up a bit, a bit too long. But other than that, it's that's still a fishable fly. Oh yeah, it's a great looking fly. You know what reminded me this of when when I tie water boatman, I use yellow dubbing. Oh yeah, and uh, maybe the size is a bit on the on the big size, but if, oh, you, yeah, do the, yeah, this if you do the smaller right. ones, for smaller boatmen, you're actually supposed to go um, with this kind of color scheme. So other than the tail, this probably is also a pretty decent boatman pattern. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know Steve. how many lakes out here we get boatmen on. I know there's some, but it's Steve, not a question. Okay. Question on the tail feather. Um, how long did you make that feather again? Was it the width of the gap or? No, the, I, when I took, I, that's the, the amount of fibers that I took off the feather were about the width of the gap, but the length is the full length of the shank of the hook out past the back. Thank it's you. a long tail. Not a short little stubby tail. What I have used uh, very similar to what uh, you did, but instead of uh, uh, I, when you made that V with the mallard flank, if if you're fortunate enough to have a mallard flank feather that is the right length for the legs, yeah, on the barbs, when you make the V, instead of cutting it close, I leave a little triangle of barbs and that seems to more easily tie on onto the hook yeah it, it it probably separates them out on the bead yeah. a little better if you do yeah, yeah. that and makes then, sense uh, uh, but but it wouldn't you wouldn't be able to use your technique of you know pulling it through yeah well just just like there, there is a video if you if you look up a uh, card of special fly uh, there is a video that's done by uh, Darren who used to be a member at Northern Lights before he moved to Ontario uh, that shows the technique quite well. And that's it for me. <laughs> Mighty, uh, Dave, question Thanks. for you. Uh, <laughs> when you're doing your dubbing, have you ever used dubbing wax? Like I've got something called swax. Yeah. Um, what one of the disadvantages of using dubbing wax is that what I like is to is to be able to slide the dubbing rope after you've created it on the on the thread to slide the whole dubbing rope up the thread to the fly yeah. before you start wrapping. Yeah. And you can't do that if you've got wax. <laughs> oh, yeah. The okay. dubbing rope won't slide up the thread. Yeah, yeah. You just have to make sure you don't use much dubbing and you really squish it down so you get a nice thin little dubbing rope. It takes a little longer to build the body, but uh, I think you get a much better uh, tapered shape to the body than if you don't. It also yeah. clumps when you kind of move it up and down the line. It clumps when you've got the wax. Yeah, if it's waxed, yeah, it'll yeah. bunch up. And then, you, again, you have trouble creating a nice profile. Mm -hmm. So, 
So now Florence going to enter this. I guess that's uh, that's that's me now. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me um, share a little photo with you. Um, this is the uh, the target for the fly I'm about to tie. Uh, this is a uh, Old Man River cutthroat caught in the fall. And they get nice, big, and chunky even in the uh, even in the upper reaches. So uh, whenever the uh, interprovincial boundary is open again, and should you ever be in this neck of the woods, uh, the old man is a lot of uh, is a lot of fun to fish, and it's really easily uh, easily accessible. Yeah, and the the Livingston as well. I'm sorry. And the Livingston, the tributary to the old man, is, is yeah. The Livingston is lovely too. It's just is suffering of an overcrowding problem. Yeah. Um, but the CFF is a uh, is a superb fly throughout these um, throughout these rivers and much of the Alberta uh, much of the Alberta foothills. So now I'm going to try to share my uh, my video of the. Uh, of the uh, uh let me go back here <clears throat> and i want to go to i guess the desktop and then i'll maximize the uh, that window with uh so now you're seeing a mess but soon enough you should be able to see my uh my hook and device okay so i'm doing this thing in a in a size in a size 14 and the ingredients are as i indicated earlier this uh macrame yarn in in two colors uh one is the one is the brown and if you have some posting material that's that's polypropylene that's probably going to work just as well okay and then the other one is is white the brighter, the better, because it, it does make this fly really, really easy to see. And it, it does work well on, 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 pretty rough, um, on pretty rough water. Then the, the color variations that I uh, mentioned are basically using, so you can play with different colors of thread and feather. Um, here is a uh, olive dyed grizzly is one possibility that I combine with olive or green uh, thread. Then there's grizzly, which is called in the original recipe. And then there is brown hackle as well, which pairs up nicely with brown thread or red thread. So let me try to do a red thread version. So I'm deviating from the standard recipe already, but you get the idea that the building of the fly is exactly the same, the same way. So this is just a dot thread, so I don't bulk things up too badly. And just build a thread base on the hook towards the tail. And then get a little bit of this brown stuff. Uh, Zilon is, a, is also a good, a good substitute. You don't want too much of this. This is just a a tail or a, or a shuck. So here is about, I start with it about uh, hook length and then I trim it to size a little bit, okay? So place it at the tail. Now this is pretty unruly material so you want to, to do a few cinch wraps before you do anything else and let go and then wind back here to smooth out this mess to the tail point. Now, it's a good idea to do the trimming of the tail. I try to do it before I do the rest of the, of the fly. And so what the idea here is, once you've tied this, this macrame in, it's very kind of bulky and unruly. Let me, maybe this is better. Um, and so it kind of sticks in all directions. And the idea here is to, to take a few cuts to try to trim the end of this messy thing to a bit of a point. 
you know, kind of think uh, that sort of pointy wedgy shape on the tail of a raven. That's kind of what I'm what I'm aim aiming for. So see how this is now being thinned out towards the back. Okay. And now I can see there are some little bits and bobs there that fluff mess. I'm not going to worry about that. Then peacock curl is the second key ingredient. And you don't want very fancy peacock here because you're going to uh, twist it and everything and it doesn't really matter. So I'm actually going to do some pretty, pretty skinny. Um, this is probably a little too skinny. This is for a size 16. So maybe I should go with, okay. So this, what I was saying is essentially peacock like this is, is a little bit too, too fluffy for this size of uh, a fly. So take two strands. I find that that's more than, than enough. Cut off from the tip generously. Don't worry about it because you want the, the stronger part of the hurl and then just attach it to the, to the hook shank right close as possible to the point you've tied in the tail. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the peacock and the thread and hold them together. And I don't know if I can actually show you this properly. Let me try. Uh, I have, usually I have some difficulty with the focus. Let's see, is this, focused enough? I'm assuming that's a yes. So take the peacock in one hand and the two strands of peacock in the other and so line them up. Four, I think it's better before because now we're a long way away from the, it's harder to see. Right, but what I want you to see is not so much the fly, I want you to see what I'm doing to the peacock and then I'm going to zoom back in. Okay, got it. That okay? Oh, yep. Then we go back to the fly. So what I want to demonstrate is this technique for twisting peacock. Now what you want for this is a pair of rotating hackle plier, pliers, such as these ones. Uh, this is the Griffin version and it's fairly readily available. Or as an alternative, there is the Tiemco version which is built on the same principles. It's a, bit, it's a bit nicer and a little bit heavier. Either one works fine. But a hack, a rotating hackle pliers are an essential tool here. So what you do is you, you clip the thread and the two strands of peacock hurl with your hackle pliers where the, where the peacock hurl ends. And then gently pull on the thread. Don't pull too hard because you risk breaking the peacock at this point and fold it back, sorry, I'm right-handed, and fold it back over the peacock and tie the thread right back at the exact same point where you've tied the peacock and you had the thread hanging initially. Okay, and then just move the thread out of the way. So what I've got now is I've basically got a dubbing loop with the peacock inside it, okay? So I've got two strands of peacock going from, from the hook end to my hackle pliers here, and then the thread going to the hackle pliers and back, and now it's tied down so the loop is closed. And what's next is twisting. So you twist the thread. So don't pull too hard, just keep it taut. Just keep twisting and you're going to get a nice little ropey thing. And now I'm going to try to do the zooming thing back in. Let me see here. Uh, come on, focus, there we are. So you can see the effect that has, right? So you create like a nice little piece of essentially peacock chenille, okay? So this you can start wrapping gently, easy, careful not to hook on the, whoops, on the thread and on the, on the hook point. 
and start building your body, okay? Now you have to keep twisting because as you're wrapping, the peacock curl is going to untwist. So just keep on, keep on twisting, you know, take a few wraps, keep on twisting, a few more wraps, and you can see how this is building up. And this little trick will make your peacock curl indestructible. You can do whatever you want to this fly. Everything is going to come apart. Actually, not, not much is gonna come apart. You're gonna lose it with a fish or with a tree, um, or the hook is gonna break. The peacock never unravels. And you can do this on anything else that calls for peacock curl. Um, and it's much, much stronger than over ribbing with wire or anything else. And by the way, you can also do this if you're doing nymphs. Um, if you want to add that little bit of extra weight, you can use wire to do the same, the same kind of thing. And the wire color is going to show a little bit through the peacock, okay? The only disadvantage of using this, this method is that it's going to give you the peacock fibers sticking in all directions. Okay, so if you like that sort of uh, peacock curl fibers all kind of nicely aligned towards the back or something, um, this isn't gonna give you that because the fibers are gonna stick in, in every direction, but you can build a very compact, tight and indestructible body. And all I'm doing is I'm trying to match the size of the peacock curl to the size of the hook. So I have here, this is some, some, some crappy store-bought uh, peacock curl with fairly, uh, I don't know if you can actually see this properly, with fairly thin, this is very skinny. So if I go to smaller flies, I use this stuff because you know, one, if I go really small, one strand is enough. <clears throat> and sometimes um, two strands and the thread give me enough bulk, I don't need more. Uh, if I use a, a full feather like this, uh, this is quite long. And so this is, you know, size 14, 12 and up. Uh, if I go below size 14, I wouldn't want to use this. This is, you can get also, you can get smaller, uh, smaller fibers here at the eye uh, of the feather. And those would work very well too. They're also a little bit stronger. So it's good stuff. Okay, so now the wing, the wing is just, a piece of this white macrame yarn. And now the, the macrame yarn is this woven thing that you have to un, undo. And for a size 14 fly, it's about one of these individual strands. This is not very easy to see because it's a lot of glare here, but like one of these strands tends to be enough going to trim off a little piece here. So when you're doing the wing for this, you kind of think um, similar sizes in my mind would be to what you'd be doing on a, let's say, um, um, on an elk hair caddis, for example, right? There'll be some trimming of the wing at the end, but that's kind of the, the, the general idea. Okay, so measure the wing and then I'm going to, I have these are already, the front end is already aligned from, from cutting it. And I'm just going to pinch this down. This is a little bit more challenging because it's more material and it's very slippery and everything, okay? And the other thing is you want to make sure that you leave yourself enough room here at the front so that there is room to put on the hackle. The other thing is that the body is tapered to get thicker towards the tying point for the wing so that this extra thickness of the body pushes up the wing at a 45 degree angle. This is important. So you don't end up with a wing that's sitting flat on the body. It has to stick up, stick up like this. Okay, so I'm going to consider this wing 
tied down. Now, what I'm going to do is slightly unorthodox, and that is I have my hackle here. And one of the problems with this material is that it's pretty thick and it's incompressible. So when you tie the wing down, you end up with the front end tapered in a, in a conical shape, okay? And that's usually a recipe for disaster when you're trying to wrap a hackle forward because then the fibers are going to be all pushed forward at an angle and you get a tangled mess and it's very hard to keep the eye of the hook uh, clear. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm going to show you how I've started to tie these flies using a reverse uh, hackle uh, wrapping technique. So I bring my thread forward close to, not quite at the eye of the hook, just a little bit behind that. And I've trimmed my feather to leave here a little bit of a point where I haven't stripped the fibers, I just cut them off so that they have something to, something to, I didn't cut off very well here. Let me try to do this. So that there's somewhere to grip. Okay, and I'm going to tie this hackle backwards. So it's the little bit of stem is pointing towards the back of the fly and I'm attaching it and moving the thread back to the base of the wing, okay? So here's my hackle tied at the front, okay? You can see it. And my thread is at the back. So now I'm going to wrap backwards and then I'm going to go with a thread through the hackle, which is also going to reinforce the hackle and finish the fly off. So here I'm going backwards and I'm taking nice turns, one behind the other. And this keeps the fibers from misbehaving. So three turns is plenty. And I'm at the back now. And I attach my hackle. Now I'm not going to bother with cutting the hackle off now. I'm just going to push it to the back and keep it out of the way. And then I'm going to wiggle my thread to the front through the hackle. I don't know how well you can see this, but it's kind of standard, uh, standard technique. Okay. And here I am free of hackle. I've only trapped maybe one fiber going forward. So I'm at the head of the fly and I can do my whip finish. I take my whip finish tool and I do one knot, okay, that looks good. And then I'm going to do a second one on top of that. This way I don't have to bother with glue. Two knots in my experience with a whip finisher is all that's ever needed, like I said, Something else usually bad happens to the fly before that thread comes undone. And now I take the scissors and slide them down gently to the base of where the hackle has been tied, pull and snip. So no cutting with a scissor motion. Okay, and now a little bit of final trimming. So the fly is for all intents and purposes done. Okay, there are some um, I can see here there's a little bit of a fiber. I think it's a piece of wing something sticking out, whatever. That doesn't make me very happy here. But okay, this is not going to win any competitions, but it'll catch fish. Um, so then the wing um, is a bit of a mess and it's a bit too long. So here a little bit of trimming is necessary. And you want... So this is kind of almost exactly the length of the tail, still can use a little bit of trimming here up top. And here at the bottom, so it looks 
a little bit like this, turn it around, make sure that it doesn't have any sort of weird additional mass in other wrong places and it stands up nicely. And the, the secret for this is with the right material, water will not properly stick in the wing and one good shake to the fly is going to get rid of all the water and then you can cast the fly back on the water and it's going to float beautifully. You just have to give it a good cleanup after you caught a fish because the slime from the fish is going to mat anything. It doesn't matter what, how good your material is. But uh, I haven't caught a hundred fish on this fly in a day. Uh, I think those days are gone uh, in Alberta. Um, but I do believe it was possible back in, when we had uh, that many cutthroat out here. So 30, 40 fish in a day, yep, I, I've seen it. So this is the CFF. Foreign, excellent. You called this a, a high floating dry fly. What do you mean by high floating? Well, it's highly visible, should I say. Um, it's not that super high floating. I mean, you've got, you've got the hackle here and it's primarily the wing that's doing the floating of the fly. So it's not, uh, so it's high floating compared, let's say, to a cling hammer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this okay. floats on the top rather than in the film. Yeah, so this this is an on on the top um, fly, and you know if you find it's that your water is too rough, and it's not going to float for you, just go generous with the float and 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 it will. So I fish this on, you know, kind of standard freestone stuff, but I've also fished it on really rough water like the Malin River in Jasper. And it, it does work in, in both of these uh, scenarios. Now in BC, this is not an issue because you're not allowed more than one fly. Some people in Alberta like to suspend a little nymph underneath yeah. this. Yeah. I've never, I've never done that. If I put a CFF, I want to catch fish on the dry. And I, and if I'm going to nymph, I'm going to put in two nymphs and fish deep. Um, but it's supposedly working. So whenever you're in Alberta, you can, you can try that little hopper dropper trick with this fly as well. We like to tie the, the nymph to the, to the bend of the hook. Yeah. So this is, the, uh, this is the, 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 the standard kind of, I mean, it's not the standard, I guess. The, this, is the, this is the red one. Let me see if I have one with the, with the standard colors here. This is the one, this is the green version. The, um, oh, I guess you can't see this. I have to, I have to do the sharing. Uh, where is it? Share screen. Okay, there you are. So this is the, this is the olive green version. So same wing, same body, but just uh, green thread and, and hackle. And somewhere here I should have the, um, the standard Don Anderson Grizzly. Yeah, there, there we are. Here is a standard. This is a big one. This is size 12. So, this so you one. fish this dry fly in the, in the spring, I assume. Yep. I'm sorry? You fish year this round. in the spring? Year round? Well, oh, well, as long as yeah, no all the time. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a year round. Now, the season, what happens is the, um, the streams where, where this, this, this fly is typically fished, or the streams where I typically fish this fly, only open June 15. And the time I normally fish this fly tends to be August, September. Uh, sometimes, you know, if, if the spring runoff 
is somehow magic or it happens at a weird time, um, late June uh, is also. But I, I suppose late, you know, second half of June up there on some of these streams is, is spring. Um, I've never tried this on the crow's nest where it was originally invented by Dawn. Um, but that, that, that section of the river in August tends to be more of a, a bit more hopper, hopper water. And the abundance of small fish that he talks about the article in, in that article on his website is, is no longer there. Now the crow is badly affected by, um, by whirling disease. Do you have that problem in BC yet with, with whirling oh, disease? Not yet. It's only on the, like, on the other side of the Rockies, I guess, in the, I think it is a problem in, like, close to the Alberta border, on the, in the elk system a bit. That's, that's what I heard from the guys who like to fish there. But it's, but I guess on the island, not a problem yet. But it's for rivers and creeks, right? It's not for flat water. Yeah. I've never tried this on flat water um, because I have other things I like to fish in, in lakes. So I, I really can't speak to that. Dave, have you tried this on lakes? No, nope. can't say as I have. Yeah. But if you tie yourself a few, a few ones, I guess smaller sizes probably for lakes. Um, size 12 is probably uh, on the big size, but who knows? I don't know. That, that would be something to uh, try. The people that fish for cutthroat in the ocean might find this a benefit. Can you actually fish dry flies in the ocean for cuts? Um, out at Souk, where the river comes in, a um, couple of our members have fished out there, different flies, but I mean, sometimes they're breaking the water. So they must be taking something on the top. Okay. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm I'm hoping to do one of these days, the uh the sea run cutthroats. Well Ron Duncan was telling me that there's there used to be cutthroat right down uh, across in front of the Songhees where I went crabbing this morning. But uh don't know if anybody's dry fly fishing. That's okay. I'd be happy to take them on a subsurface thing too, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here the thing is that they're they're such a great uh, dry fly fish in the streams. Yeah. That, and and sometimes if 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 you go late enough in the summer, you get this this these runs with really deep clear water and you put the dry fly on and it takes nerves of steel because you, you see the cutthroat coming from the bottom through all this water to your fly. And you gotta sort of hang in there and just wait until it turns back down that. with it, you know? I love that. It's, it's spectacular, yeah. Just and watch, it, watch them come up. Yeah, yeah. They, they come up out of Deep holes for this stuff. That's that's in the in the gap on the on the old man, right? Uh, actually, for, for actually further up. Um, yeah, a little. In the in the gap these days, you know, it's uh, it's pretty busy. It's crowded. I mean, it's there. There are a few guys who are, who are working there, and it's. It's it's gotten. I haven't fished the gap in in a number of years. Usually we drive through and we we kind of make a little. We bet on nothing basically, but we we make a little theoretical bet about how many trucks we'll see parked in the gap. 
And yeah, some of the bigger holes on the castle on the West Castle uh, are pretty good for that too. Yeah, the, the, the castle is nicer because uh, it requires you to walk yeah. a, a fair distance. It's, it's still fairly busy, but if you, if you walk, um, you know, the, the, the castle, like that, that section between where it forks into the, the south and the west castle and the campground, yeah, still a, it's still a good section. And then if you go further down below the confluence with the Carbondale, uh, you've got to leg it there a little bit. But Carbondale's you can have these days too. where it's just you by yourself. Yeah. Um, but it's a challenging thing in the sense that late summer, the water is very low. And the fish are in a small number of big pools. And there are zillions of fish. You can see them. They're like sardines on the bottom of that pool. But they're not moving until there is a magic time in the evening. Five, six, seven, depends. If a bit of a rain shower comes in, it could be a different time. But then bugs come out. And then these pools come alive. But you just kind of, I don't know, you have to get a book with you or something and go and sit by the pool and wait. <laughs> For the action to begin but when it begins oh man and so yeah they're 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 cutthroat they're uh, sorry they're they're primarily whitefish rainbows and bull trout in there the cuts are further upstream yeah. they're upstream of the falls but yeah the castle is a good is a good river to fish something like the cff it works very well yeah This is, this is Don Anderson or Dan Anderson's fly, originally? Don. Don, Don Anderson, Thanks. yeah, he's, he's the guy who came up with this fly. Thanks. He's a uh, cane rod builder, and, and he's been a very generous patron of the Northern Lights. He uh, annually donates a cane rod to our fundraiser in the fall, uh, raffle. Uh, it builds really nice cane rods. So, excellent. Thank you. Well, I'm going to check out, guys. See you, Ara. Likewise. See you, guys. Thank you very much. Very informative. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, for you guys, I started, I recorded this session, but I forgot again for the first five minutes. So the tape will have the <laughs> missing the first five minutes of uh, Dave Robinson's part. Oh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Dave and Florin. It's it's um, good to see we had uh, sixteen people on at once or on at the peak. So that's better than we do when we have them in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's just say that um, at 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 the moment I don't really have an option. <laughs> this is. Uh, for me to be able to do this is is really the the silver lining of this whole mess. <laughs> uh, Dave, well, I must worked out quite well. With I your think. Uh, rendition there of the CFF, I think it should get first prize. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I have to practice a little more. It's not that <laughs> it's not that good, but like I said, they they work. It's it's. What's nice about this is that this is a fly that will work even if it's a little imperfect. Yep. Excellent, guys. Thanks. I'm going to leave too. Thank you. Okay. See you next Tuesday. time. Okay. Have, a, have a good week, guys. Yes, I'll Tuesday. see the rest of you on Tuesday. Yep. Tuesday morning. <laughs>